well, Christianity is not about um, a set of rules, and Christianity isn't, um, Jesus didn't come to give us a new set of rules. That's not, that wasn't his whole goal. Um, his whole goal was to give us his life. And what did John 10, 10 say? You guys remember this verse? I came that you might have life and that you might have it to the full, or in some translations it says that you might have it abundantly. You know what that verse means? That means not that you'd be able to carry out a bunch of good deeds and bad, you know, not do bad deeds and do a bunch of good deeds and live according to the Ten Commandments and have the fruit of the Spirit as you see in the, in the New Testament and, and all that kind of stuff. He said, I came so that you would have life, that Jesus Christ didn't just come to give his life for you. He didn't just, he didn't come just for that. Um, that's really where we stop. And that's why the Christian life, you kind of come in here ho-hum and kind of bored with this whole thing, to be honest with you, if you if you be honest, I'm kind of bored with Christianity because uh, Jesus Christ died for my sins, right? Jesus Christ gave his life for me. But the thrill and the fun and the excitement, the energy from you, the passion will come when you understand that he came to give his life to you, that the very life of Jesus Christ was made to be lived through your life, that we don't trust Jesus Christ as our savior and then now it's all about religion, now it's all about us doing good deeds now. Okay, I need to be a good person now because I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. That's not it. That's not the Christian life. And, and maybe a light bulb just now came on for you because it's like, whoa, maybe that is why I don't have any passion. It's, it's so that he can live his life through me in the exact same way that I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. That the same way, the same gospel that saved you, that moved you from religion into um, Christ, into um, now it cannot be taken away from you. Okay, hopefully you understand that we don't maintain our salvation through our good deeds. Do you, do you know that? Do you realize that? that? That now, like, your bad deeds isn't going to be somehow, like, that he's going to take that away from you. And that motivates to, us to really tackle what we're talking about in this series, that the Christian life, what does this even mean? That the very same gospel that saved you, that moved you from good deeds, bad deeds, and that's how I earn God's love, i.e. religion, and moved you into an unconditional love relationship with your heavenly Father, that that very same mechanism, the gospel, right, is the same gospel that um, produces the Christian life through you. The Christian life isn't manufactured, we said a couple weeks ago. Christian life isn't manufactured by us. We don't manufacture our fruit out of the edge of the branch, and I'm just going to will this fruit to, to go onto the edge, edge of the branch. He says, as you rest in me, my life will be produced through you, for you can do nothing apart from me. That fruit will be produced through you. Um, the fruit of the Christian life isn't manufactured by us through our own self-will and through our own self-effort. In the same way that you didn't do anything to get your salvation, that it was done for you and it was g given to you, in the very same way, the, the Christian life is, is not you doing some good deeds and your own effort and you trying really hard to do these good deeds. That's, that's living according to the flesh. That's just another version of religion. That the Christian life is through us saying, what's the helpful phrase that we've said in this series? I can't, but you can through me. Just as I can't produce my own salvation, you have to do it for me. I can't do good deeds. You're going to have to do it through me. That is the Christian life. And when you start to experience that, you start to realize what we talk about and what we sing about when we sing about freedom. That, you were free, that you're made to be free. You're free from the chains and the bondage of I've got to do and I'm really going to try hard. And, and maybe you even might be saying, you know, you're not coming alive with this because it's like, yeah, I tried that. I heard that once and it didn't really do much for me. And, and I just can't seem to get this concept that you're talking about, Justin. And that's why I, I've just elongated the series. <laughs> Today's going to be a little bit shorter message. Um, I want to clarify something today and then next week we're going to do the fruits of the Spirit. I'm going to do the, the set of verses right before the fruits of the Spirit. I know last week I promised we get to the fruits of the Spirit uh, this week. But I really want to drag this out as long as I can and, and clarify some things for you and, um, and, and, and in the hopes that you'll get it, that you'll get the, the Christian life, that the, the, the light bulbs will really come on for you. But that <clears throat> what I desire for you more than anything else is that you would understand the very life of the Lord Jesus Christ can, will live his life through you and, and, and that he didn't come to, to give his life for you he came to give his life also. He also came to give his life to you. That's huge. It's huge, huge, huge. And our job as Christians is to learn how to let the Lord Jesus live his life through us. <clears throat> so today, for the next few minutes, I want us to get a clear picture, as clear as I can make it, 
of, of where the Holy Spirit is leading you. Um, we're we're going to understand this, at least from this passage, where the Holy Spirit's leading you and where the Holy Spirit is going to prompt you, what, what the Holy Spirit's going to prompt you to become, and then what the Holy Spirit is going to prompt you to do. And the reason that this is important is because as you and I begin to take baby steps, and that's the process, it, 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 that's important that you understand that this is a process. It's take baby steps. You're not going to like become perfect at this overnight because we're just so into um, doing our own, you know, kind of manufacturing it from ourselves and You know, some of us really think of ourselves still as self-made men and self-made women, and I am where I am in life because, you know, I did all this effort. And and you may have done a lot of good principles, obeyed God's law, and and done a lot of good um, principles, and God's blessing that. If you live according to his design, there's blessing in that. But it was all from you, and it was all effort. And it's so difficult for you to shift over to, it's him through me. It's not me. I'm now broken. I'm now weak. I can't do these things. And that's something that some of us have discovered is that I really can't live out the Ten Commandments. I can't live out these things. As hard as I try, I kind of have a few good days, but then I can't really do it consistently. And God's going, that's exactly where I want you to be. That's, That's exactly the sweet spot. That's where I want you to be for you to realize that you can't produce the Christian life. You can't do all of these commandments. But if you'll, if you'll say with this heart and you'll kind of approach it, I'm broken. I'm, I'm weak. I can't, but you know what? You can through me. Then this will really become a life-transforming series for you. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. If you don't have your Bible, you can look on to somebody next to you, or you can download the YouVersion app from your app store. Just go straight to your app store and type in YouVersion, whether it's Android or Apple, and um, you are going to see something very powerful today. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 16, here's what the Apostle Paul says. He's writing a letter. He's talking to some Christians who they've understood the gospel. Um, he, at least he thinks that they, they have. Um, he kind of had to clarify that a little bit in chapter 1 and chapter 2. Um, those of you who know Galatians, you know that joke right there, a little snicker. But he, the, at least he thinks that they're Christians. And if they are Christians, then they're struggling with living the Christian life. They just don't, can't seem to get this whole idea of living the Christian life or, or Jesus Christ's life produced through uh, them. And so he says this in verse 16. He says, so I say, live by the Spirit or walk by the Spirit, some translations say. Both mean the same thing. Notice that that's a command. It, it's not optional. He's, he's giving them a command. <laughs> that's not for some hyper-spiritual people only reserved for, for those special people. It's for all of us. <clears throat> and then he makes this promise. And if you'll do that, live by the Spirit, if you'll do that, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Look at that. You will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Both are synonymous, the flesh and and sinful nature. Up here on our box, we've got the flesh over there. You could say sinful nature. You will not gratify the desires, and that's a key word, desires, of the sinful nature or flesh. Now, this is an amazing promise because, you see, For years, I thought that the Christian life was do the best I can not to sin, and do the best I can not to sin, and do the best I can not to sin, (laughs) and I'm getting exhausted, and do the best I can not to sin. Okay, I messed up here. Now I'm going to pick it up back today. Do the best I can not to sin. That's not it. That you get up every morning trying to, you know, just do good and and put all this effort into it. That's sort of the game that I played with God. But the Bible says this, that if you and I will learn to walk according to the Spirit, and we're going to flesh that out here in just a second, the outcome is... Walking by the Spirit, the outcome is you will not fulfill or carry out the desires, desires, desires of the flesh. In other words, our goal in the Christian life should not be to live our lives not to do certain things. That's not our whole goal. Our goal as Christians is to live our lives to do this one thing and one thing alone, to live by the Spirit, to live by the Spirit. And it's a process, and it's not something you're going to get overnight But you can begin to have three minutes a day, you know, three separate minutes in the day, like for 60 seconds and then back into the flesh. But, but, you know, the next day it's going to be five minutes of of walking according to the Spirit. And then you get into a rhythm. I'm telling you, there's momentum with this. And and the flow of the Spirit, it's really unbelievable when you realize it's all about love. And I can't, but you can love through me. There's freedom there. He says, if you will learn to walk according to the Spirit, you won't carry out the desires of the flesh, key word there, desires, that your and, and mine desires 
will slowly change. This is how the momentum is generated, that we begin to desire what God wants. We begin to crave, and, and even in Ephesians, um, Paul talks about it like getting drunk on love. Um, don't be drunk on wine, but get drunk on love, that, that you'll begin to love and desire the very same things for people and the people in your life, the way that God loves those people as you begin to give one minute of the day and then two minutes of the day and then an hour of the day of walking in the spirit, that it's a process. <clears throat> the answer is not trying harder and committing more or making a deeper commitment. The answer is to learn to allow his life, his spirit, to empower you to be and to do these kinds of things. And then he goes on, and, and boy, this is my favorite part. And I have to tell you, these two verses, I wrestled with them for years because I just didn't understand them. But Paul gives us a great clue in these two verses about walking in the spirit, what, what this really is for us. Verse 17, <clears throat> for the flesh, for the flesh or the sinful nature, desires what is contrary to the spirit. And the spirit desires what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. Look at that. It's, it is, isn't this exactly our dilemma? Like, you know, I, I do what I don't want to do, and I, I don't do what the Spirit desires, which is actually what I, I do want to do. He picks up on this concept in Romans chapter 7 as well, but he, he says it here as well. He says, <clears throat> here's what that verse is describing. He's describing a person that is approaching temptation. Okay, here comes along this temptation to go off onto this site. Here's, here's this temptation for me to get angry with my children, for me to snap back at my husband or wife, or, or there's this temptation to lie or, or to cheat or, or to ethically at work or to get one up on, on the person who I, I want their position or I want to get, the, get a promotion over them. Here comes this temptation, and you begin to approach the temptation from the standpoint of walking in the flesh. He's describing a person that is uh, po- probably a, a Christian, they may not be a Christian. Of course, that's why I always like to clarify the gospel because <laughs> they may not really understand that the gospel is the very way that you live the Christian life. I always want to make sure that do you realize that you don't do anything in order to get God's love. You realize that, that it can only be given to you by faith, uh, by grace through faith, that we receive it by grace, that the cross of Jesus Christ, the death of Jesus Christ, and we receive it by faith. Now that that's clear... <laughs> Now we have a starting place. The very same gospel that saved you is the very same gospel that produces the Christian life. Now that we understand that, okay, he says, here's what's happening. You find yourself in a situation, if you're a Christian, and and, and you do these two different things. You want to do what's right because you want what God wants, and you want to be that person of character, but your flesh is saying, do what's wrong. And you kind of want to do what's wrong, too. You know, it's like, that's there. And he said, if that's your approach to temptation, then you lose every time. You do. You're just going to lose every time. Here's why. Because it's religion. You're not free. Because you want to do what's right, and if you do what's wrong, and you don't do what you want to do, right? If you don't do what you want to do, then then you sort of feel like you're left out, and you're missing out. But you sort of want to do what's wrong, right? And if you do what's right, then you, you get to do what you wanted to do. But now um, I sort of feel like I missed out again, right? Either way, right, no matter what, you lose. Because if you do the opposite of God's command, you sin, and now you have a consequence. If you do right, then I sort of feel like I missed out. And he's saying either way, you lose. <clears throat> when you do what's right, you lose because you didn't get to follow through on what you wanted. Two illustrations, okay? Let me give you some some illustrations. You're a single adult, and and you're committed to being moral, and you're committing to being pure, and and you've kind of put the whole sleeping around thing behind you, and, you know, that's in your past, and and you're going to do what's right, and I'm really going to, you know, do what's right now, okay? I'm going to make this thing work. I'm going to do relationships right, all that. But you work with this guy who comes in after every weekend, and he's been up in Buckhead on Friday and Saturday night, and he starts telling you about all his exploits and and what he did, and and starts telling you all these stories, and blah, 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 and stuff that you wanted to do, right, or that you used to do, and you kind of don't do anymore, but you kind of still want to do, right, and and you're kind of (laughs) mad, and part of you, if you're real honest, you're mad that you can't get to do all of that stuff anymore, right, and on the one hand, you're glad that you're saying no, right, because that's that's past me, that's in my past, on the other hand, you're kind of jealous of this guy, because you're you're not... (laughs) 
And you're not thinking about leading to Christ, right? It's like, oh, God, let me pray for him. No, that's the furthest thing from your mind. You want to, you know, punch him out. You're kind of mad. Why? Because you're mad that you don't get to do that kind of stuff anymore. You just sort of want to, you know, you want God to get him, right? If you pray about him at all, it's like, God, get him, right? And, and strike him dead because he's doing or strike him, maybe, maybe make his relationships all, you know, horrible or, or whatever because <clears throat> you've actually gotten a little bit self-righteous now, you see? Have you noticed that? You're becoming judgmental. You've gotten self-righteous because you're not sleeping around anymore. Because the truth is, even though you might be doing what's right, in terms of the decision, you're not free, and you're judging him because you're jealous of this guy's situation. You see how this works? You're not free even though you're doing right. Or maybe you're married, and you've kind of come to grips with the fact that what the Bible says about finances, and I'm going to do my finances God's way, and and, and, you know, I really want to honor God with my finances. I'm going to manage it according to a budget. I'm going to put God first with tithing, and I'm going to save. And then I'm really, I'm going to get out of debt. And then all that God says about managing the whole 100%, I'm really going to do things. And you, you've begun to experience the benefits of doing it right because God blesses these principles even when you do them in your own effort. But you've got some neighbors, and they've got two cars, and a house full of incredible furniture, and, and they're just always getting stuff, and, and you know, they're, they're going into debt, and, and, and you know that you want those things too, <laughs> but if you bought all those things, then you go into debt too, and, um, you know, and, and so you're upset, and, and their sin has kind of ruined your joy and your peace, or, you know, of, of um, you know, it's hard necessarily to, to see greed or to see, um, what's, the, what's the word, uh, materialism, yeah. It's hard to, to see that as sin, but you know, they're, they're kind of, their sin has kind of destroyed your joy and, and your peace because in your heart, you sort of want to buy the same stuff. And you're not praying for them, right? You're not thinking about, well, how can I you know, build a relationship with them so that I might lead them to Christ? That's the furthest thing from your mind, right? You're not thinking about that at all. You're, you're not concerned about them. You hope they go bankrupt. So you go, aha, see there? You know, you disobeyed God and, and then you went bankrupt, right? You, you managed your money, you violated his principles, right? And you're judgmental. You, you're, you're now judgmental. Here's why. Because you're self-righteous. And, and this is the most, I mean, when I, when I meet Christians, you know, uh, usually if a Christian is in front of me for counseling or, or they're here at this church and, and they're kind of talking to me, usually they kind of err on the side of doing what's right rather than the hedonistic side, right? I'm going to just, I'm free now. Jesus has saved me, so I'm going to just sin all I want, Right? You usually get the Christians who are over here on this side, and here's why you get self-righteous. Here's why you're so judgmental. It's because you did it in your own effort, right? Your prayer isn't, I can't, but you can through me. Your prayer is, I can. Well, I mean, after all, look at my life. I'm awesome, and I don't need God to do it through me. I can, and so you, this, this self-righteousness grows, and you start to look at what they're doing at work or whoever that you're judging and, and that you might even be missing out on and there's a little bit of jealousy and you begin to judge them. Now, see, that's not walking according to the Spirit. If you're getting judgmental, if you're self-righteous because of all of your good deeds, let me tell you something. You aren't walking according to the Spirit either. You're walking according to the flesh. Why? Because you did it. You did right. You're awesome. And now you're taking pride. And there's an arrogance about you. And you begin, and listen, there's the only kind of people who, are, who, who are, are judgmental people because it's only God who's supposed to judge. Newsflash, it's actually God who's supposed to judge, okay? God's the one who judges at the end of time, okay? If you're judgmental, then you're arrogant. And, and you're arrogant because, and I, I've been there, okay? <laughs> You've gotten self-righteous. I'm awesome because, after all, look at what I do, okay? <clears throat> I did it in my own power. And, and the Bible says, or Paul says, as long as you're in that dilemma, the Bible says you lose both ways, whether you sin all you want or whether you do it in your own power and I'm going to really do right, I'm going to do this, right? <clears throat> Either way you go, you don't want, <clears throat> let me say this, you don't do what you want to do because you and I are schizophrenic morally. <clears throat> you want to do what's right and out of self-righteousness you get judgmental or you do what's wrong and you have sin, and now you have the consequences. 
of sin. And either way, you lose something, you give up something. If you do the temptation, let me be clear, if you do the temptation and give in, right, you've sinned and you have a consequence, so you lose. If you don't, then you get judgmental to the people who do do those things. And out of self-righteousness, you know, you, you're, you're judgmental. And now you've hurt the relationship, most likely, because they can feel it. Even if you don't say the words, they can feel it. They can hear it in your tone. They see it on the expression on your face. And, and you just kind of give off the nonverbals. And you hurt the relationship. You lose relationship, because sin always destroys relationship, too. You lose relationship either way. And the good news is this, okay? And this is why I wanted to spend the whole day on this, okay? And it's going to be briefer than normal, but I, I want you to see this, okay? The good news is this. There is a third alternative, there is a gospel alternative. <clears throat> now look at, at, at this verse. This verse didn't make a lick of sense to me for years until I understood what we just now said, okay? <laughs> look at what the Apostle Paul says next, verse, verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. To which we say, what? The Ten Commandments? Like, doesn't that matter? <laughs> And why did God make such a big deal on Mount Sinai, I have the Ten Commandments, if I'm not now under the law? I mean, is this even the same Bible? Is, is the God of the New Testament different from the God of the Old Testament? I mean, now he's saying the law doesn't even matter. What does this have to do with anything? I live by the Spirit. He said, yeah, if you do this whole, I got to do this, and then I got to do that, and I got to do this, and I got to do that, either way you lose. It's not freedom. So the conclusion is, the summary is, <clears throat> verse 18, if you're walking according to the Spirit, you are not under the law. And, you know, I used to think there must be some verses left out because it's like, well, what is he even saying there? I mean, because God found it really important, right? The, these commandments are important for a reason. And, and what did we say last week? We said that, look, the, the law or the, the commands of God, and next week we're going to look at the fruit of the Spirit. This is what the life of God produces. This is what the life of God Produces. Key word. Produces. You can't manufacture the life of God. The life of God is produced through you, and here's how you'll know if the life of God is being produced through you. It will produce love, as we saw that the Ten Commandments were all about. Love God, love people. It will produce the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience. Kindness. And if I'm not experiencing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, then guess what I know? I know that I'm producing. Whatever's coming out of me is my life, not the life of God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? They're all God in three persons, three in one. The life of God is not being produced through me. Now, <clears throat> this is huge, okay? He says, if you are walking according to the Spirit, you are not under law. What did Jesus say about the law? He said, because they thought that he was saying, um, you're talking bad about the law. You're talking bad about Moses. And, and so what is the law even for? He said, are, are you saying that the law is supposed to be done away with? He says, oh, no, none of the law will be done away with. Not a jot or a tittle, not even the smallest stroke. I have not come to do away with the law. I have come to what? What's the word? Fulfill the law in you. I have come so that now the law is fulfilled on your behalf, and now you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Now walk in the Spirit. I didn't just come to give my life for you. I came to give my life to you so that now the life of God could be produced through you. I have come not so that you'd have a bunch of more things to do. I have come so that you might have life and have life abundantly. See? This is so, so huge. When you and I hit a temptation... Bump, here's a temptation. And then it's a temptation that you give into all the time. You just anger, you know. Here my husband comes in again, and, and here he is bringing his bad attitude, right? And it's just, I know exactly how to respond. I know how I have responded a thousand times before. And, and it's just a wall of temptation or lust or, or maybe your wife comes in with this or your kids spill something again. And you've just responded habitually over and over and over again. And it's this wall of temptation, like, I can't do any other thing right now because in this moment, I'm just overwhelmed, okay? When you're walking according to the Spirit, your responsibility isn't to choose right over wrong in that moment. Because when you're walking according to the Spirit, you are walking under the precondition of, I don't have the strength 
to choose right over wrong in this moment. Remember, I can't. I don't have the power to choose right over wrong, so I'm not going to. I'm going to choose brokenness right now. You know that word broken, it, it, it's really interesting. We use the word broken, and you may have heard this before, but it's okay. Hear it again, right? <laughs> we need to hear the same truths over and again because it, it, one time it finally clicked, right? But with a horse, right? A horse is not useful to a human being, right? Unless they're what? Okay. So, so right, a horse is a horse, right? Just like you're a human is a human, okay? But a horse is not useful, or a human is not useful to God until it's what? Broken. It's adopted this, I can't do right over wrong in this moment. I'm broken. And what did Paul say about it? He said, when I'm weak or broken, when I'm weak, then I am what? We know these verses, guys. We know these verses, but we can't seem to live the Christian life consistently. It's when I'm weak, when I'm broken, when I say, I can't, but you can through me, that's when I uh, see the life of God produced. In fact, Lord, if I'm real honest, I don't even have the desire sometimes to choose right over wrong. But when you're walking according to the Spirit and you hit temptation, your response isn't, which way do I go? Your response is to choose the third option, the gospel option, which is, I choose weakness. Last week, it's, I can't, or I choose dependence, that's another word, or I choose submission. If you really grasp the authority and how God works through authority, you know, maybe that's your word. Submission, all of these words are synonymous, broken, weak, dependence, I choose dependence. I choose submission in this moment. You can through me. In other words, I choose death. I choose rest, right? Life comes from death. Life comes from rest. We see this with our sleep rhythms. We see this with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He died first. What did Jesus say? When a seed goes into the ground, you and I are are, are the seeds in that analogy. When a seed goes down into the ground and dies, it is only then that what? Life can shoot out of that seed, and there can be a shoot that would then blossom and turn into maybe even a tree or whatever plant it is and bear fruit. It is only when you and I die That's the gospel. That is the resurrected life through you. And it doesn't come from us choosing right over wrong, and I really need to try harder, and I sin just now, and I need to keep doing more. No. The Christian life is, I can't. But you can love through me in this moment. I'm adding that word love because it all revolves around love, right? What were the commandments all about? Love God. Love people. Now, You see how there's no self-righteousness that can come from gospel living? See that? If you're starting to feel self-righteousness, I'm better than them, or I can judge them because I'm not doing like them, you know that you're not living the gospel. Why? Because you can. You're awesome. Next time you face temptation, I can resist that temptation. It's no problem for me. I'm awesome. And you've got a pride. You've got a, hey, I'm righteous. And notice, it's self-righteousness, right? It's not God righteousness. It wasn't righteousness that God gave me. It's self righteousness. I did right by myself. And so you've gotten prideful. That's how you know that you're missing the gospel on the other side of hedonism. It's called legalism, the legalistic. It's it's just another form of religion. All right, so <clears throat> it's no longer, okay, <clears throat> I'm going to do right, and I did what's right, and I really wish I could have done wrong. None of that either. It's like that whole experience just shifts. Your whole Christian life just shifts to freedom. Oh, wow, I can just live in a state of rest, of, in a state of, like, he's already done everything for me. He's, he's fulfilled it for me. Now it's just a matter of me, like, living <clears throat> with him and, and being in relationship with him. Verse 18, if you are walking according to the Spirit, you are not under law. Now here's the law approach to temptation. I shouldn't, but the law says don't do it, but I want to do it, but I don't want to do it. It's a spiritual schizophrenia. And I encourage you to read um, Romans 7, if you want to jot that down, Romans 7, verse 21 through 25. If you're in a small group, we'll we'll, we'll discuss that this week and really kind of go deeper because he describes this whole dynamic again. He says, if you're in that whole dilemma, okay, that is not the Christian life. And even not sinning in that scenario is not the Christian life. Because this, the person that has a lot of discipline, <clears throat> has a lot of willpower, right, overcomes temptation, 
then you become judgmental and critical and doesn't care about unchurched people. <laughs> You'd rather see them die and go to hell than to stop judging them. You know, that's just your focus, right? I just want to judge them, judge them, judge them. I'm not thinking at all about not praying for them, right? I'm just thinking about how I don't do what they do. You know, it's sort of like this, you've had your fun, now you need to pay for it. We just sort of have this, as Christians even, can you believe that? A condemning way about us towards even other Christians, but especially non-Christians. He says, that is not the Spirit. You are not being led by the Holy Spirit if that's your fruit. And you say, well, <clears throat> I've never had those thoughts. I really want to dig in. I really want to kind of needle in. I'm not a judgmental person. I hear that so much from Christians. Uh, okay, look, <laughs> you judge them. You do. Come on. We, we all do it, right? What's your relationships like with unchurched uh, unbelievers? You think about them. Aren't you a little judgmental, right? especially over this last year, right, with all the division in the nation? I mean, pick whatever issue you want to talk about. There was two sides that were diametrically opposed, you know, and you just judge one of those sides. Or maybe you were one of these Christians that said, I judge both of them because both of them I see like sin on in both sides. And I'm so awesome because I just see I'm enlightened. I'm awesome. I see, and, I, and so you judge both sides. <clears throat> and so we're not thinking about praying for them. We're not thinking about love and, like, and even a heart of compassion for both of them. We're judgmental. See, it looks spiritual, but it's religious because I'm doing good on my own. Look at me. I'm better than you. I see better than you. <clears throat> it might even have an element of consistency morally. You might even be doing right regularly. But that's not what the spirit-filled life creates, and that's not what it means to walk according to the spirit. And so next week, <clears throat> we're going to talk more about, as I've said, um, the, the, the spirit and what the life of God produces. But this week, I wanted to clarify for you what walking in the gospel was and how we can miss the gospel. <clears throat> and that's really what, when you hear the spirit, okay, uh, you know, hear the gospel, okay? When you miss the gospel, you miss it from both sides. It's either I'm saved and I get the, you know, I'm, I'm the law is fulfilled, so I can just sin all I want, and that's called hedonism. And then there's the other side of I actually do what's right pretty consistently, and, but I did it on my own, and so now I'm awesome, right? Self-righteousness, and, and you, you judge the people who don't do like you, right? And, and that's missing the gospel as well, and that's called legalism, okay? And you want everybody else to do like you do, because if everybody just did like I did or think like I thought or, or saw like I saw, right, especially over this last year, the whole world would be so much more balanced because I'm such a balanced person, right? I, I'm in the middle. None of y'all are laughing. Either you're very convicted right now and it's like, or you're judging me and you're like, but, but, but isn't this the deal? Like, isn't this what we struggle with? Like, this is, this is the deal. You, you probably just understand this completely and you walk by the Spirit all the time and it's like, oh, what else you got, Justin? What else you got? So, all right, so let me, let me, let me kind of wrap this up. <clears throat> here's my idea for today, okay? And this is Paul's idea for, for today. He, hear this, okay? How do we live the Christian life? Here's what Paul is saying. He's saying, dance with the one who brought you to the dance, okay? When I say phrases like, the same gospel that saved you is the same gospel that produces the Christian life through you. He's saying, dance like the person, excuse me, dance with the person, <laughs> Who brought you, can we go back to the previous, I'm not, I'm not there yet, who, who brought you to the dance, okay? How were you brought to the dance? You were brought to the dance, not of your own effort, not of your own good deeds. It isn't about doing. It's about what was done for you. Now, just dance with the, the being who brought you into salvation into the dance, right? Just, just in the same exact way. I can't, but you can through me. Now we're ready for the next. It, it's not through your discipline. It's about your dependence. It's not about your commitment, or I put, uh, I, I realize this, um, preacher always needs to start with the same letters, right, so that it's sticky. So I finally thought of my E here for empowerment. It's about, it's not about your, your effort, Right? or your commitment, or your strong will. I'm just going to do this. It's about empowerment. It's not about what you can do in this moment. You want to change your family dynamic? You want to change your marriage dynamic? You just, 
these, these patterns that you find yourself in with your wife or with your husband, you really want to change that whole dynamic? It's not going to be through strong will and I just, what do I need to do? No. It's about what can he, what would the person of love do through me? And I'm going to say, I can't. I can't do that. But I, as I'm talking with him, that's where the conversation comes in in this relationship. What would he do? Let him, let him speak that to you. If you're not used to this rhythm, you have to kind of ask yourself the question, what would he do, right, in this moment, the person of love, do in this moment? And then you respond to that with, I can't. But he can through me. It's, I'm resting. I'm resting. I'm going to rest. I sometimes have to lay down on my bed, y'all. Like I sometimes, in the moment when Elizabeth does something or something like that, it just like gets in my crawl or something that activates some of my emotional bruises or whatever, because I got them. Okay, look, I'm not, right? And, and, and she does something, and I just know, I'm just overwhelmed with responding in this way. I go to my bedroom, and I just, I just lay down on the bed, because I have to physically like do what I've got to do spiritually, because I have to will myself not to respond in that moment. Anything that I say is just not going to be helpful or going to cause more dysfunction or cause more death, right? Wherever there's sin, there is a death. Right? So when you feel that anger rising up in you, I, I'm just going to go, I can't. And I'm going to fall on my bed and I'm going to say, but you know what, Heavenly Father? You can, you can love right now through me. And I get up and I go do that. And I, and I take on eyes of compassion. I, squint, I sometimes have to squint my eyes because that just kind of helps me get to that loving place. You know, do whatever you got to do physically to get that posture, to get that, that place where you... Um, can get into the flow of the Spirit. Bill Bright always talked about the flow of the Spirit. He'd come back from vacation, and he'd say, it's good to get back into the flow, to the flow of the Spirit. Do you all know Bill Bright? He's the one who started Campus Crusade. The flow of the Spirit. I love that. Um, you know why you always need a vacation from your vacation? You know how? It's because Christ is your rest. You know? I think you put your hands together we're all like, when am I going to get my vacation? Or you've seen other people go on their vacation this summer, and you're kind of looking at your budget. I'm not going to get to go on vacation. Said, Did you know that that vacation, if you went on it, you'd come back and you'd need a vacation from your vacation. You remember, you remember that, right? It's because the only thing that's rest for your soul, your human soul was made to be at rest even when you're active, even when you're working, even when you're... He's the only thing that's going to satiate your soul. And so the immediate result, I'm just going to give you three immediate results that, that you're going to see as you begin to do this. Your desires are slowly going to change. When, when, when they walk into the office and, and, and she starts talking about what she always talks about and it just kind of rises up in your spirit and then she walks out and you've kind of got all this anger now because she did it again. In that moment, you'll begin to see that your desires are changing to, I want something for her rather than what I want to do to her. I want something for her. Now, slowly, not, not every time, but as you begin to walk with the Spirit, your desires, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. That's, pro, that's in Proverbs, right? As you walk according to love, the person of love, and you begin to get into this rhythm, you'll find that your desires will slowly change. And then two, you know what else? <clears throat> you'll realize what is of the fruit of the flesh and what's of the fruit of the Spirit. This word flesh sometimes gets you caught up. What is of the fruit of me? Or what is of the fruit of the Spirit? Okay? You begin to discern, okay, like I just now did earlier. Um, if I'm experiencing anger right now, I know that that's of me. Because I've got this list, as I've read ahead. Maybe this week you read ahead in this same passage, Galatians 5, 18. Just read all the way down to 21. And, and you'll see the fruits of the Spirit. Anger's not listed there. But you know what is listed there? Peace. Peace. If I'm experiencing peace right now, you know what? This is from... The Spirit. And you'll be able to discern what's of me and what's of the Spirit. And then third, <clears throat> you know what? You'll quit blaming everybody else in your life for your lack of character. You'll, you'll, you'll quit blaming, well, if only she would stop doing this. I could be the man that I am called to be if she would stop. You know what? The life of God doesn't come from your wife. And she can't make you do anything, sir. She can't make you do anything. Well, she made me mad, or he made me mad. No, nobody made you anything. You get to choose. Am I going to live by the Spirit, 
Because the only thing that's going to come out of me in this response right now is either a me response, the flesh, or the spirit come out of me in this moment. You'll quit blaming everybody else in your life for your lack of character. You'll quit blaming um, your husband for your lack of self-control or or, or your wife for your lack of faithfulness. And I just got to go look at this because she won't do certain things in our marriage. I, I feel like I'm a victim. And you'll, you'll leave that victim mentality when you begin to walk by the Spirit because <clears throat> I know that this is really about me and my relationship with God. No matter what she does, no matter what he does, no matter what my friends do or what they say on Facebook, right, uh, TikTok, whatever it is, I, I, I'm responsible for my response and I'm not going to blame other people. Jesus didn't come just to give his life for you. Jesus came to give his life to you. And my friends, the power of God, you'll begin experiencing the power of God in your life and you'll begin to experience an excitement for the Christian life that you never thought was there and still haven't had ever since you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. When the the lights came on at the gospel, that's kind of the last time you had a spiritual euphoria. You'll begin to re-enter that spiritual euphoria that maybe you had in high school and and maybe with your college friends when, when you came to Christ and you were swept up in their whole thing. You begin to like go, man, I want this. This is, this is amazing. And, and it would just be so thrilling for us as a church <clears throat> where the leadership, if the leadership were to really embrace this and all the staff were to really embrace this and all the membership were to really grasp the Christian life and individuals, each of us as individuals, and we begin experiencing this in our family. Imagine what would happen in your life. Imagine what would happen in your marriage. Imagine what would happen in your family life if you were to begin walking by the Spirit. I can, but you can through me. And my prayer as we land the plane today is that with every single message that I give or or every principle that I give, marriage principles or here's how you raise your kids and we go through a series on parenting, that all those principles, any principle, fear or finances or sex, whatever we're talking about, that it would be understood in, in, in this mindset. That you know what? You really can't do those things. You can't live your life sexually the way that God wants you to live your life sexually in this culture. I mean, good grief, look at all the, look at all the tempting. You can't, but he can through you. Or financially, that you can't manage your money the way that God wants, but he can through you. That it would all be under this, that we would never leave this. And we would say, you know what? I got it in this series. And we as a church, we're made up of individuals, but then collectively as a church, that we live by the Spirit. And what could happen in this city if we began doing that through us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> turn us into a church that lives this out. The leadership, the members, individuals, kids, teenagers. And Father, today I pray <clears throat> that you take these simple words. It's simple, yet so few Christians live it. And, and you'd plant it in our hearts, deep in our hearts. And we'd really say, even if in this moment, We'd say, well, I'm, I'm not going to, I mean, if most Christians don't get this, I'm not going to get it. But we'd say, you know what? I really can't. And that that would be the watershed moment. That would be the breakthrough of, wait, I actually, the reason why so few Christians get this is because we all default to this. Well, I'm, I'm sort of your average Christian. No, I can't live the Christian life. That's the whole idea. God, that you would plant this truth deep into our hearts. And Father, that we would leave here today with a clearer picture of where we're going, where you're leading us, and an even clearer picture of how you plan to get us there. Father, we confess today as a group that we cannot, oh, sometimes we can do right, you know, and sometimes we can do it in our own effort, do right, but then we get self-righteous. But in terms of consistency and relationships and all these qualities, we cannot, but you can. And we're trusting you to do that in us as a church well as individually. And that's our prayer, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.